<clears throat> thanks. So uh, good to see everybody. Uh, happy Friday, and uh, thanks for sticking around to the end of the conference. Uh, so she did a good introduction there. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Today we're going to talk about Kubernetes. Uh, we're going to look at it from an architectural perspective. Um, when we design uh, our multi-tenant types of systems, uh, where we, for example, have uh, lots of different platform teams maybe consuming the same architecture. Uh, so we're going to look at how to isolate our services, um, what the container runtimes provide, what the orchestration frameworks give us, and uh, we'll look at some kind of patterns for authentication authorization um, as we build out services and give people access to do things like spin up services, kill things, deploy, pull secrets, and things like that. Uh, so she did a good introduction. That's me, uh, Jack. That's me teaching my daughter manners on the left. Uh, if anyone wants to hire a Golang developer, uh, she's maybe got a couple years till she's there, but she's really expensive. Uh, <laughs> do most of my dev these days in Scala and Go. Uh, I, I got the Go bug about a year ago and just uh, do quite a bit of de development there. Uh, and I've been running Invisium since 2009. So what is Kubernetes? Uh, I'm sure everybody in here has either uh, run Kubernetes in production uh, or at least heard about it at this point. Uh, so Kubernetes uh, is a system that lets us uh, deploy and scale our containerized microservices. Uh, so generally, we're not doing things with the Docker daemon, like uh, spinning up a shell script and uh, you know, running a lot of containers. So we generally use an orchestration framework uh, that handles things like scheduling, uh, resource allocation throughout a cluster, uh, things like that. Um, it, it gives you a lot of security scaffolding, and uh, there's a lot of good things you can do. I feel like I'm screaming into this. Um, but at the same time, there's also a lot of uh, nasty things you can do as well. Um, you can move really fast. Um, you can overprivilege things. So lots of times we see people uh, give people access at the cluster level when they can be kind of pushing that down to a namespace. Uh, so the way you initially kind of roll out um, your platform is uh, probably the opinionations that you're going to keep till the very end. So some of those things uh, you do want to think about early. Um, how do people kind of build uh, and design around your systems? Uh, so with regards to um, isolating containerized workloads, so here's an example of um, a Kubernetes cluster. Uh, so in the top box we see the Kubernetes control plane. So that includes things like the API server, uh, etcd, which is the key value store that backs the API. Uh, the scheduler, uh, controller manager, and other, all the key components of the control plane. So uh, if you pop the control plane, get root to that, it's most uh, often game over at that point. Um, you have the ability to pretty much do whatever you want um, to those containerized services within the cluster. Um, so generally you have one or more masters, uh, and then you can have essentially zero or more nodes. So basically nodes are generally where your containers actually run. So uh, here's where the container runtime uh, runs in that stack. Uh, so we can think of Docker, we can think of uh, other container runtimes we'll talk about um, that we can swap in at that layer. Uh, and as we can see, uh, we end up spreading those maybe between nodes, right? So one service uh, could be running in pods across maybe multiple nodes, right? So we have to think about how that kind of security boundary stretches. Um, things like um, user privileges, right? We have to replicate those across hosts. Um, so those are the considerations there. But we want to keep you in the container, right? So think about a multi-tenant environment where you have you know, 20, 30 different app teams um, deploying to a common platform and infrastructure, right? We want to make sure that we have clean isolation between services, that we can't move laterally. We make it pretty hard to elevate privileges. Um, but in reality, uh, we often make it pretty easy to attack other services. Um, so we expose services, uh, which means that we expose uh, essentially a TCP UDP access to other containers. So lots of times uh, we have the ability to call out across namespaces uh, to talk to other containers. Um, and sometimes we'll also run with shared privileges where we may end up running um, with you know, shared, acts, uh, shared privileges in the cluster between, which means they could do things like pull secrets for other applications if they're running as the same account. So we want to think about how do we kind of get out of the container and attack other ones. And if we have that level of access, we can do things like run API commands. Uh, so we want to be really careful what we can do with other containers. We also want to protect um, the actual uh, node and control plane components. So uh, there's been a bunch of uh, vulnerable kind of defaults out of the gate for the kubelet over the years um, that have made it a little bit easy to kind of attack a host. Um, if you can basically compromise something like the kubelet, um, you can use that to kind of get you know, more privilege access to a uh, upstream to the API, uh, so on and so forth. And you can also attack the uh, API itself, right? So uh, most things that actually happen are API driven. 
uh, including things like pulling secrets, um, access to volumes, and things like that. Um, so if you run, or for example, you can pull the service account token for another service, um, you can impersonate that at the API level. Um, so different things to consider in terms of what we want to protect um, and isolate. Uh, but in a multi-tenant environment, we really got to think about these things. Um, when we deployed things like monoliths, uh, we had kind of separation, right? We ran like a VM, and um, in reality, we use a lot more shared infrastructure. And then the container runtimes, uh, the daemons, also heavily use uh, host resources. And we'll talk about things like namespaces and control groups. Uh, and we have a blurring between who does what, right? So there's kind of sometimes in, in groups I've seen, they have it really figured out. Sometimes it's not a clean delineation point between who does what anymore, right? So um, is it up to the developer to, you know, for example, securely configure their pod specs? Um, or does somebody else do that and they're just up to basically the Docker file, right? Um, there's really no one size fits all. And what I've seen is it definitely depends on team size, composition, maturity. Uh, but it is interesting because um, what you do kind of see is that sometimes there's fumbles. Um, somebody was doing something at one point and somebody's not doing that now. So when people migrate their architecture, um, these are kind of some of the problems and trying to figure out who does what. Um, and in a multi-tenant environment, there's things that platform team just straight up doesn't care about, right? Um, if they provide you a secure platform to operate on, then they, they put a lot of the security decisions back to the developers that are building um, various microservices. So um, it is important to kind of figure out who's going to control what. Uh, so in Kubernetes land, uh, K8 is a real easy way to kind of abbreviate Kubernetes, so we'll use that. Uh, we talked about having masters and nodes. Um, so the master is uh, pretty much the brains of the cluster, and then the nodes um, are what end up doing a lot of the work. Uh, with regards to pods, so pods are essentially allows us to represent one or more containers, uh, meaning that we can you know, deploy containers um, with some uh, dependencies and everything like that. So we do have tighter coupling when we deploy things like that. Um, but then there's also things that break down in that security model when we share container resources within a pod. Um, and workloads are just different ways we can, uh, you know, build resiliency strategies and how we deploy things, um, how many instances that service needs to be running, so on and so forth. Uh, more often than not, we have a Docker file. Uh, so you see more container runtimes um, that you're able to use now because of things like OCI specification and Kubernetes is CRI uh, runtime interface. Uh, but most often than not, we're using a Docker file, right? So we're generally extending from an image. Um, we can push in things like environment variables, which we have much better routes to do than, you know, pass those in via environment variables. Um, and then we pull in our code. Uh, on the right-hand side, it just kind of shows how Docker's evolved um, to how it kind of works now with its daemon, uh, container D and run C. But essentially, you have uh, a fat daemon uh, that ends up spinning up container instances. So uh, generally, that's using things like um, uh, C groups and namespaces uh, with on that Linux system. So I'm not talking about Windows much today. I don't really spend much time in Windows land, which I know, you know, Windows has things like, for example, uh, Hyper-V integration, which um, kind of goes outside of some of this. Uh, but generally when we're running Linux containers, they're not really great sandboxes. So uh, we use things like uh, C groups and namespaces, which um, if you've looked at container escapes over the years and ways to kind of get out of Docker and others, um, they've often been, you know, things that haven't been incomplete namespacing of resources and stuff like that. Um, so you've been able to jump out of the container in that way. So uh, with regards to being a great sandbox, it's not. Um, but we end up enhancing that model by using things like seccomp, the block syscalls, um, using app armor and lockdown, things like capabilities and uh, different entitlements you have on that system. Um, so these things aren't perfect, um, but we, you know, have that as an option. Uh, some of the container runtimes, you know, have better defaults out of the gate. Docker does pretty good there. Um, with regards to giving you um, a hardened seccomp policy out of the gate if your container actually supports it, um, but you, you do have to use those things, right? Uh, OCI specification allows us to use more container runtimes now, so CRI is kind of the hook for that. Uh, and if you look at what that ends up doing, it cleans up just a lot of the spaghetti code with trying to implement different container runtimes, um, but gives you some standard interfaces that you can use. Uh, and things like default capabilities are pared down even more from like the OCI specification, um, as opposed to things you even get within Docker's um, defaults. Um, but obviously the container runtime, you know, generally builds upon those as well. Uh, with regards to isolation methods, um, that's kind of the traditional route we just looked at, um, using things like namespaces and C groups. Uh, we won't get too deep into some of them, but just I like to just kind of give everybody a sampling of what's out there. Um, GVIDs is a cool project uh, spun out of Google. Um, they use a user space kernel um, to essentially do things. So uh, whereas Docker runs highly privileged on the host, 
um, they run a user space kernel. Um, you have a subset of all the syscalls available, and you don't actually pass those to the underlying system. Uh, so it kind of proxies them um, essentially in GVisor land, uh, which reduces a lot of the surface um, for getting out of that container and, and elevating privileges um, and attacking things on the host. So uh, this is something you could flip on um, fairly easily nowadays. Um, some of these things are less stable probably than Docker in, in, in honesty. Uh, but I like the way where I like where they're going with security. Uh, hypervisor kind of mode, um, using things like clear containers that spun out of Intel that's now Kata containers. Um, it allows you to run your container um, inside of an actual hypervisor, um, which they use like QMU Lite, basically, um, which gives you basically the first layer of what you get in isolation from the container, and then you also get what you get at the hypervisor level. Um, so you do make it a little bit harder to jump out and attack things on that host. So control groups and namespaces are uh, how we do things in Dockerland, which I imagine most of you are running. Is anybody, just out of curiosity in here, run a container runtime in their environment that's not Docker? Any Rocket or, uh, no? All Dockerland in there? Okay. Um, but we do see things like, for example, times, not fully namespaced. So we do want to be careful when we grant the container the ability to do things, uh, because those actually impact the actual system itself. Um, as for the different container runtimes, uh, this is a good table. It just kind of gives you a sampling of what the runtimes provide out of the gate. Um, so you can see where things stack up with regards to, you know, hardened sec comp, app armor, um, the ability to actually do things like um, drop capabilities, uh, do things like um, limit the ability to escalate privileges. Um, honestly, Docker is probably the furthest along in terms of all of them, uh, just because people have put a lot of time and effort into Docker. Um, so in a cloud native architecture that we're going to be running on Kubernetes here, um, these are some of the most important things, right? So container isolation we've been talking about, um, really important and essential in a multi-tenant environment. Um, we'll look at the control plane a bit now. Um, the control plane, again, if we can compromise the control plane, um, we have a really bad day. Uh, if we think about a couple months ago, if anyone remembers when Tesla um, had a Kubernetes cluster popped, um, it was like exposed API server and they were a dashboard and were able to basically do things inside of that cluster and watch crypto miners and things like that. Um, so this is one of those things where you can have it hidden behind things um, or you can drop security groups in AWS and Azure um, fairly quickly and expose these resources. So um, I have seen people expose these things and, and, and have problems. Um, things like, for example, network segmentation are, are very opinionated. Um, do you, for example, do really strict segmentation or um, do you use something like Istio and just kind of set some really hardened defaults, right, and then um, poke holes in that? Uh, that's the thing I've seen kind of be a religious thing. Um, everybody has their own way they want to do that. Um, but things like authentication, um, we have to think about how, again, the container uh, authenticates and also how now we get into users and people that are going to be deploying services, um, having the ability to pull things like secrets. Um, so we obviously want to know who they are and we obviously want to limit um, what they can actually do in that cluster as much as possible through things like role-based access control. Um, and secrets management uh, is something that's supported pretty first class in Kubernetes, um, but people often default back to really bad practices. And we'll take a look at some of the options there. So control plane. Uh, first off, we have things um, scoped at the cluster and namespace level, right? So um, things that are scoped all the way at the cluster level um, propagate down to namespaces. Um, and this includes uh, different things we're going to hit through the API server. Um, and there's also things that are non-namespaced as well, or they're non-resourced, rather. Um, so we have a couple different ways of communicating and, and getting access to objects in the cluster. Um, namespaces, when we start building out our cluster, essentially allow us to uh, split out the environments. Um, but we get some isolation there um, in terms of like the scope of where things like secrets can propagate um, and how far your RBAC privileges go. Um, but once we start doing things like exposing services, well, then we have, um, you know, network access um, across namespaces. So that does break down, and that's not really a hard boundary in that regard. Um, but things we want to do to protect the control plane, right, we want to do things like set resource quotas um, for namespaces and, you know, do those things at the pod level as well um, to make sure that one misbehaving container can't consume an unlimited amount of resources um, and start bringing down control plane components. So we do want to make sure that we kind of limit that scope. Uh, so from the control plane, we took a look at that. We have the master, and then we could have uh, more, more than one, zero or more nodes. Um, if we have zero nodes, and that means we're running containers on the master, so you can actually taint the master, um, basically to run uh, and, and run containers on it, but it's not something that's supported out of the gate. Um, and some of the security model obviously breaks down if you're running those things on the master, right? Uh, so we don't generally want to do that. We want to run at least one node. 
And if we're using a, con a managed service uh, like AKS, EKS, um, GKE, uh, they give you managed control planes. Um, you have a little bit less control over what you can actually configure there. Um, but I mean, it does take a, a decent amount of work off your plate um, where they manage the control plane, which is often uh, one of the hardest things to do to, to harden, keep up with, um, restrict access to. So I've seen people do things like give all their developers SSH access into master because they um, didn't want to do things like expose um, the API uh, endpoint in a different way. So um, this is a place that you can overprivilege what you give people. More often than not, you don't need to give most of your team SSH access to the master, right? Um, because if you get onto that master and you have privilege access, you can read things, especially if, um, you know, etcd is going to be on there, which is your key value store. You can do things like read all the secrets, right? So um, you can encrypt secrets at rest, um, but it is fairly weak, right? So um, this is one of those places I stress you, like, um, don't give people SSH access into the master if, if they, unless they really need to. Um, but now we get into where uh, these workloads start to um, spread across nodes um, and we start to kind of open up holes where we can poke in those. Uh, and how do we actually call things? Um, there's various API groups um, and essentially everything is RESTful, right? So we can communicate um, using pretty much REST calls and bearer tokens. Um, and earlier on it was kind of a little bit flatter and they've broken things out quite a bit into different API groups. Um, but the good thing is that um, because things are broken out into API groups and within those API groups you have uh, more granular resources, um, things like pods, things like um, secrets. Um, so you have things that you can kind of bubble down to um, and you can give people more granular um, role-based access control to those. So as Kubernetes has moved things out into APIs, um, it, you, can, you have more access and control over that. Uh, and things you can do with the API, for example, um, if you are a container that has privileges to run, um, say, for example, using like shared service count credentials, um, you can actually do things like run API commands um, over REST, right? Uh, and this is something if you've, again, like blocked like, you know, incoming firewall stuff and so you're restricting inbound um, uh, network access to a container, um, this is something that's still going to work because there's essentially a service um, that runs at the cubelet that allows you to essentially still send containers in. So this is outside of kind of the behavior of what you can uh, harden at the actual container itself. Um, so you can obviously limit the scope of these attacks by, you know, keeping privileges for people low um, and, and not sharing credentials between containers. We can also do things like uh, use emission controllers um, within the control plane. Uh, so uh, at the API server we can do things um, like set pod security policies, um, force you to pull clean images um, to, you know, limit the amount of malware that can kind of get shimmed in there, um, and different things. So we can actually enforce these uh, as, as emission controls when you actually get admitted to the cluster. Um, so we can do things, for example, like say if your container is um, deployed with things like, you know, root privileges, well, we're not going to allow you to pretty much, um, you know, run, come in the cluster doing that. So um, you can kind of set that first wall of security controls, um, take some things out of the, you know, uh, developer's hands or DevOps or whoever's building um, those pod specs for you. Uh, you also have uh, different authorization modes. Um, so most uh, build tools nowadays will turn on things like RBAC. Um, and they'll also turn on the node authorizer. So the node authorizer is nice um, because it limits uh, what the cube can actually pull from uh, API server um, with regards to things like uh, persistent volumes and secrets. So basically if the cubelet doesn't actually own that pod, um, then you can limit what you can do upstream there. So that is one of those things that uh, if you want to limit uh, how bad a cubelet attack is going to be for the rest of your cluster, then you definitely want to have the node authorizer enabled. So let's talk a little bit more about the pods and containers themselves. So um, those are some of the things you kind of run to in the control plane. Uh, different. Uh, what I've seen is a place that people go wrong. So you can just, you know, roll things out with the default and you're probably more often than not fine in a lot of cases. Uh, different deployment tools. Um, does anybody use a tool called CubeSpray in here? No? Um, CubeSpray is really, really bad with their defaults. Um, things, for example, like uh, they enable um, etcd on all uh, network interfaces and then they drop things like uh, mutual TLS between clients and peers. Um, I'm not sure if they've, you know, maybe fixed that within like the last month, but that was uh, something that I know to be open. Um, and I've actually seen people deploy clusters with that and, you know, thankfully they've been able to fix that stuff. Um, but it's one of those things if you're not actually looking at the opinionation that the build tools are using or the deployment tools, um, then you can actually end up with a lot more security issues than if you would have just ran um, using like cube admin to build your cluster. 
So the positive containers um, are where we kind of get into, you know, pushing things down. So some teams, you'll have a dedicated platform team that runs the control plane and all that stuff. And then, you know, sometimes that may be developers that are running control plane. Uh, but where we get into where, you know, this gets pushed down to developers is more at the pods and containers level. So take, let's take a look at how we harden those. So pods are the smallest deployable units in Kubernetes. So we can have one or more containers inside of a pod. Um, and within those, we can do things like set security context and pod security context, um, where we can set some first line of kind of defense um, in our pod spec that actually happens above, essentially, if you look at the order, uh, the container manifest, right? So we have the ability um, at that level to, you know, set different runtime flags for the container uh, runtime um, that, that gives you the ability to kind of control that, you know, one step closer to actual deployment, right? Um, and using pod security policies on the other side, you can actually do enforcement of those things that you're trying to uh, push standardly. So the security context, here's just a simple table that shows you um, what you get at the pod level and what you get at the security context level. Um, so a few things do um, overlap, but essentially uh, the rule of thumb is that if you apply something at the security context level and at the pod security context level, um, then the pod security context, or I'm sorry, the uh, security context um, at the container level actually takes precedence. So it's always closer to the container. Um, so if you do have overlapping settings, um, that's gonna be how they're gonna be resolved. Um, but essentially, you know, there's things you can, you would want to apply um, at the uh, security context level. Um, you have that assurance that any container that's running within that pod is at least gonna have those things set, right? Um, with regards to things like base image management, uh, so I would like to tell people, honestly, keep your container images as small as possible. Um, limit the amount of packages, right? Um, don't, don't build from like, you know, extend from like the biggest uh, image possible. Um, things like Alpine have had issues recently, but you do want to kind of favor containers um, that bring a lot less kind of packages because every one of those packages is something that's essentially got to be patched or what's going to end up being um, a post exploitation tool for an attacker that gets on there. So, right? Um, things like curl, right? Stuff like that that uh, maybe you need it on there, maybe you don't, right? So, if you can limit those packages, great. Um, what people also run into is that uh, you'll use, you'll want to use containers that actually don't support some of the things we're talking about here. Um, so they have to be compiled with support for things like SecComp and AppArmor. Um, so it is one of those things that you do want to check um, because again, the container runtimes do give you some security, uh, but you actually have to have uh, support compiled into your kernel to actually be able to use those things. Uh, and you can run those commands if you want to just do a quick sanity check. And, and one other thing is using uh, specific version tags when you're pulling things down as opposed to latest. Um, if you're pulling down container latest and you don't really know what you're getting, right? Um, and you don't have that same control over versioning which goes into your environment. So I do always like to tell people use image tags explicitly wherever possible. <clears throat> uh, so talking a little bit about SecComp there. So SecComp allows us to start filtering the different syscalls um, that we can uh, use. Um, so essentially the different you know, Linux syscalls allow us to do you know, pretty much all the privileged operations um, that we actually do that's supported by the kernel. Um, and there's a lot of dangerous ones that you know, honestly you, you don't need. Um, and as we restrict those, we essentially, you know, start the container from a much uh, more restricted uh, starting point. Um, and again, setcom has been supported for a while. It has first class support um, in Kubernetes and you can apply it at the um, pod level and you can also enforce those things uh, at a pod security policy as well. Uh, and AppArmor, for anyone that's not familiar with AppArmor, um, Docker also does have a strong um, default AppArmor profile. Uh, be, by, by strong means like they've, they've considered some basic things that containers don't need, right? Um, in reality, if you were going to build an app armor policy by hand, it would probably be a lot more strict. Uh, and if you were to use any tools um, that would actually profile, for example, um, the different capabilities used and the different uh, files that you access, there's a handful of tools that you allow you to actually do that with app armor, then you would get a much more restrictive policy. But uh, in reality, most, um, honestly, Java developers aren't that deep into things like AppArmor and SecComp and SE Linux. Um, so if you can get by it with the defaults, that's great. Um, and I'll show you in a minute how you can set those. Um, but yeah, if, if you want to actually build those, then there's tools out there to kind of give you a, a leg up as well. Um, capabilities are another thing. So basically, uh, once upon a time, Root was all powerful. Uh, Root got broken down into a bunch of different capabilities that we can give it. Um, so things like capsys admin and ptrace um, and some really dangerous capabilities are blocked by default um, with most of the container runtimes. Uh, we can turn those back on really, really fast if we need to. 
Um, but we can a lot of times keep those things off. Um, but sometimes I've actually seen security tools uh, that actually do require you to run significantly privileged. Um, so some of the um, container uh, security tools that are out there right now uh, actually do require you to run things like ptrace and capsys admin. Um, so you, you do kind of get into a realm where you need to maybe allow, you know, some namespaces to have some of those capabilities in order to use those tools. But you could also, uh, if you were to drop everybody into a namespace, um, highly overprivileged what those containers can get um, because you'd have to poke holes in them for some, you know, security tooling that I see used pretty heavily in the industry right now. Um, but yeah, if you can basically limit things down to the Docker default capabilities, you get rid of a lot of different attack vectors. Um, ability to abuse uh, network interfaces, um, elevate privileges um, by abusing things like set UID and set uh, group IDs and stuff like that. Um, so kind of cool if you can limit this. Uh, more often than not, we can basically, you know, get down to something like that where we're using, you know, net raw because we need to use ping, right? Um, I can't stress that enough. Uh, and we'll look at, you know, for example, uh, things that we also often share are, you know, access to network. Um, you know, so on the host, for example, in the network namespaces, we often, uh, you know, kind of cross those over, um, and IPC, uh, as well as, uh, you know, process IDs and things like that. So pod security policies um, allow us to uh, mutate things um, on a mission and enforce uh, some minimals. Uh, so more of the build tools now, uh, I don't believe they all turn PSPs on, so you usually do need to um, enable this, and I, I think the managed platforms all give you the ability to use pod security policies as well. Um, but basically there you have to have that um, admission control uh, flag enabled. Um, and there's a couple weird rules there that kind of throw people off. Um, really the one is like the alphabetization um, of how things are picked. But essentially um, if it is um, an update, um, then it's going to be rejected um, from that perspective. Uh, I don't know how well you can see. I think you can see that hopefully well in the back there. Um, an example on the left is a pod security policy. Uh, so at the left, um, we'll just kind of drill through all the pieces there. Um, let me make that just a little bit bigger. Um, so up here we have um, different annotations. So what we're saying there is that uh, uh, each container, um, we would prefer that it pulls um, and uses um, those profiles, right, for um, set comp and app armor. So by default, uh, that's going to default to like container runtime for Docker. That's going to use Docker's secure defaults. Um, but that also caveats that we have um, compiled support in our kernels to use those things. Um, going down there, uh, things like privileged, right? We want to restrict uh, can you be root. Uh, things like allow privilege escalation. So that um, limits the ability to, you know, set, um, set you know, UID and uh, group ID flags and elevate privileges. So you end up working with the effective UID of yourself at that point. Um, so that's the ability, but you can actually set that and enforce that. Um, and then we have a couple things that allow us to limit what you can actually consume on the host, um, IPC, uh, namespace and stuff like that. Uh, and we can also limit which uh, users the containers can actually run as, right? So we can use, um, for example, a min of one and a max of 65535 for user IDs. Um, to limit using uh, user zero as root, right? So we can set these things and that, you know, we have some assurance that when we're deploying um, that we have, you know, some minimums that we're adhering to at that point. Uh, this originally derived from OpenShift and their um, security context constraints. Uh, so if you work in like an OpenShift environment, then you can pretty much apply the same methods um, to what we're talking about today. Um, and you can apply different pod security policies as well. Um, so you can have more than one. And these are applied at the cluster level um, as opposed to actually at the um, namespace level. Uh, and we do have to attach role-based access control, so that's kind of the one that if we don't have um, roles that are actually privileged to pull that policy, then they can't consume them. Um, so you do want to make sure that you use role-based access control for that. So um, another thing we can use is uh, user namespaces. Um, so newer kernels do support the ability to do this. Um, Docker has support. Um, Kubernetes, it's kind of buggy. Um, but you essentially at that point um, remap who that user is on the actual host to essentially a high um, numbered UID that has essentially no privileges. So um, if you're able to essentially compromise, you know, the container, um, then you have limited abilities to kind of do things on the actual host kernel. So um, to do that obviously in Kubernetes land and, and do that in a distributed fashion across um, a cluster is hard, so there's been, been bugs with that. 
Um, but you do, if you can enable that feature gate, then you can actually use that ability, um, which uh, essentially that's the flag that's getting passed in a Docker to do that. Um, rootless containers are kind of another thing as well, so we can run our containers with essentially without root. Um, things, for example, like building packages and doing installations require privileges. Um, so seeing the kind of different rootless tools and techniques, they essentially use um, file system snapshotting and they won't actually ever give the final container root and they'll just incrementally change what that file system looks like and then give you an unprivileged container to work with. Um, so run C uh, supports those things and it's been fairly limited. Um, surprise, Kubernetes 1.12 actually does support it. So um, if you were to use um, the pros mount security context attribute, then you could actually um, set that. And so obviously you can leave that blank um, for root. So um, I don't know how well it actually works um, in production. Um, I've messed with it. I've looked at the code. Um, let me know. Uh, no new privileges is another thing as well. So we talked about that. Um, we can set that in our pod security policy um, with allowing privilege escalation. Um, essentially that uh, limits the ability to elevate privileges um, so essentially if you're using like, um, you know, something that has, you know, root privileges on a, uh, on a binary, um, you're not able to basically use those, you're down to like effective privileges. So um, the whole theme here is that you want to limit what that attacker can do um, and elevate to and jump out of that container with. Uh, Read-only containers, um, this is kind of one, uh, if you don't do stateless stuff, then maybe you can work with like a, a, a read-only root file system, um, but these things don't work maybe in all cases for everybody. So, um, authentication. Authentication happens at a couple different layers. Um, the API has to authenticate users and developers. Um, you have to authenticate nodes to the cluster. So when we join a new node, um, we generally have a token that we join up with and um, authenticate ourselves with, uh, which don't generally change. Um, we have things like webhook and endpoints that we can um, send things from. We can tie those things into admission control. Um, so when we think about authentication, there's, you know, a couple different uh, surfaces that we need to consider. Um, Kubernetes provides a handful of different ways to authentication, ranging from basic auth, um, X509 certificates, um, using uh, JWT tokens, which uh, is one of the, the options we look at. Um, things like basic auth obviously aren't a great idea for many, many reasons. Um, users, are, you know, user and passwords are stored in plain text on the host, et cetera, et cetera. Um, they get sent in every HP request, so usually want to avoid those. Uh, really no same way to manage things. Most people default to things like X509 for developers. Um, subjects, uh, so a user um, can be a developer. Um, a sub service account uh, is generally what the containers get privileges as. Um, see people abuse service accounts to do things like dashboard access. So they create a service account per developer or whoever needs to access the dashboard and then they use that JWT until the end of time. Um, so that is one way you can also abuse service accounts. Um, the one thing I guess that stands out there is um, if I tell people don't use basic auth and, and tokens and things like that, like those um, in some cases might require like a cluster restart to flush those things out. So um, you do want to avoid some of those routes. Um, so service accounts, so one token to kind of rule them all there. So by default in each namespace, um, you get a default service account. So if you don't actually use an explicit service account for it, then you're essentially using that same service account across pods, which means that they all have the ability to pull the same secrets, um, run container commands and others. Uh, so this is where you kind of want to get into um, creating a service account per. Um, earlier versions of Kubernetes, there was kind of some weirdness between um, etcd and uh, checking the, the, the tokens basically where if a user was removed and the, and the token, the JWT still passed, um, you know, all the signing and, and integrity checks, um, then it would still work. So that's, that's kind of cleaned up by default now where it'll actually defer to etcd to make sure the user exists. Um, so in each basically namespace you get a default and that's actually a fairly easy fix there, right? We create um, a user for each one and then within that pod specification, um, we actually use that service account, right? So problem solved at that point, they're all gonna get their own JDBT tokens. Um, and then you could actually provide, you know, use uh, RBAC to, you know, give them limited access opposed to their old shared privileges across things. Um, talk a little bit about authorization. So authorization is fun because um, we can really overprivilege things um, and uh, by default, uh, you see, you know, a couple people get cluster admin out of the gate. Most of the time when people set up a cluster, 
Um, and then they either start to give people lesser access or they give everybody cluster admin. Um, and that's really hard to rein in like a year later um, when you have to have arguments with people about their access levels and why they have too much. Uh, role based access control though allows us to restrict those things and we can set things at the cluster level and we can also set those at the namespace level. Um, but we essentially start from uh, first we create a role. Um, so on the left hand side there we create a role called read pods. We give it the ability um, for the API group there. So by default that's like the core objects. So you know the, 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 the standard things, pods, containers, um, and you know all the primitives that have been around for a while are within that group. Um, from that we can get a little bit more explicit and get down to the actual resources themselves. Um, so we can get even further down from you know that in the pods uh, to even limit what you can do within pods, right? Um, but then we can limit uh, what you can do from a verb perspective. So there we're just pretty much doing um, uh, essentially uh, read types of things, right? So get, watch. So watch in Kubernetes land is uh, something that interfaces with etcd that allows you to have a watch on an object that changes. Um, and if that changes you can get basically like you can consume that event. Um, but at this point we're not giving it the ability to do anything um, that's like state changing, right? Uh, kill services, uh, mutate anything running, uh, so on and so forth. Uh, on the right hand side is how we actually bind that um, to an actual um, uh, subject. So we have in that scenario we have a service account um, and then we're actually doing that in a namespace at that point. So um, that's actually an example of like a namespace, right? So we're not giving him uh, cluster ability. Um, sorry. Uh, the thing that you usually see people kind of go wrong there with is um, adding a lot more of the API groups, I guess, out of the gate than you need. Um, a lot more resources, giving you all verbs, right? So you can use like a wild card to do that. Um, so again, you know, anytime you do access control and start these things out, start from as little as you need. Um, the thing too with uh, Kubernetes is back is that it's also cumulative at that point, so you can't actually um, take away any role based access control, you can only grant at that point. So um, if you have multiple roles associated with you, then it's just basically, um, it adds all those up and, and determines what you're able to do. Um, and if you actually look at the code where it actually, you know, essentially does those role based checks, um, it's just essentially just a set of like nested loops, right? It starts with the API group, goes down to the um, resources and then it goes down to the verb. So it's like three layers of nesting loops at that point and how it actually checks those things. Um, which kind of confused me. Um, I had been writing some automation tools um, and those rules just kind of took me a little bit to kind of figure out. So uh, maybe they're more obvious to you but I had to play with that for a bit. Uh, we'll kind of end here on secrets management and then happy to take any questions. Uh, so secrets management is one of those things that you can kind of butcher um, pretty easily. Uh, so lots of times people will uh, provide secrets in the form of environment variables. So if you do the environment variable route then essentially those are available to any process within that container. Um, so you don't get the ability to do like things like discretionary access controls, right? So it's just basically in like a set command, it's there. Um, with regards to using the actual secrets management facility, you do get the ability to um, mount a secret um, and have a little bit more control over it. Um, but we can also uh, do that pretty poorly as well. So the top one there is an example of running Docker with like um, dash E flag for environment variables. Uh, that's what you see a lot of people do. That is the worst way to do it because it's going to show up in things like logs. Um, it's going to show up in things like shell history and so on and so forth, right? Uh, and you know maybe the scripts that you're also using like launch those things off, right? So if you can avoid this form of like secrets management then do it. Uh, there's totally better ways. Kubernetes has a secrets management uh, API so you can use cube control to create the secret. Um, and you can do that from either file or you can pass those as like command line values. Um, so that's a better way to do it because you're essentially using Kubernetes' uh, facility to bootstrap those containers um, with the secrets um, and they mount those as a volume. Um, but there's kind of some downsides there as well. So uh, it's still stored in plain text by default in etcd. So when I was telling everyone like don't give people like SSH into like your etcd and masters, like this is why, right? Um, if you can read etcd which again is a uh, key value store, right? Um, then you can pretty much dump secrets at that point. So um, depending on your tolerance for risk, this is either a horrible thing or something that you expect. Um, you can encrypt them uh, as of 1.7 and up. Uh, the downside is that you also have like um, symmetric uh, encryption uh, key stored within basically uh, a flat file. Uh, 
uh, that you still have to store somewhere, right, um, to basically encrypt those secrets at rest. Um, so it's only encrypting them inside of etcd at that point. It's not actually encrypting them, for example, um, if somebody has RBAC ability to actually call the API and pull secrets on behalf of that, right? So um, what you get at that point is you get um, encrypted storage like at rest, right? So one place. Better than you get um, out of the gate, but not perfect in a lot of kind of scenarios. Uh, and then you see people using uh, integrations with things like Vault. Um, so this is from an OpenShift blog. I didn't actually make that myself. Um, but essentially kind of the, the, the workflow there is that you can use the service account token uh, to essentially identify what service is uh, unlocking a secret in Vault. And then if you make an HTTP call out to it, um, you can grab an individual secret at that point. So what ends up happening is that you can mount that and make that available to the container. Um, but it's not actually something that's, you know, for example, persisted within the cluster at that point. Um, so then you kind of get some separation there between like um, storage in the cluster and then storage um, in another place. But then you have, um, again, all those practices like are you using the same uh, service accounts for every single service? Because then every service can still basically use that token to unlock the vault, right? So you've basically taken the same problem and you're just kind of shifting it to another place. Um, Seeing kind of with the managed services and seeing things like, you know, their key management solutions with the different uh, cloud providers um, seems to kind of become the first class approach to doing this if you're using like a managed service. Um, and I kind of like, you know, the kind of set it and forget it approach to, you know, rotating secrets and uh, managing access and stuff like that. Um, and here's uh, just a simple script. Uh, basically what you end up doing is um, in uh, essentially before the actual container lifecycle starts um, in pre, uh, container, you're using essentially curl to call out to it. Uh, you're using that um, service account token that's mounted in that um, host itself. And you do the API call, um, use that as a header, and you can unlock the secrets that have been stored within that vault. Um, and then when you actually uh, go to actually spin up the container itself um, at that part of the container's lifecycle, um, it has that secret available to it um, that it can use, right? But um, it's not persisted at that point within the cluster, which is, which is very different. Um, that's my show, everybody. So um, hopefully the things I talked about today, uh, think about security early in that process. Um, the more, you know, essentially namespaces you stand up and the more microservices you launch, um, the harder it is to kind of clean these things up and the sprawl and the, and the technical debt that you're going to accumulate um, out of the gate. Uh, so definitely think about, you know, the kind of patterns, um, how your teams kind of organize around code and projects. Um, how tightly coupled do you want different services and, and things to be? Um, and kind of architect around that. Um, definitely focus on the lo logical and organizational structure. Um, you want people to be able to move fast, but you also want them to be able to move safely, right? Um, so hopefully we've seen there's things that you can push and let the developers do, um, or whoever, you know, DevOps team, uh, engineers, uh, AppSec, whoever basically manages those things. Um, but you, you want to make sure that you also have, you know, different layers of controls um, that, that are going to block things. So things like emission controllers um, and stuff like that are really important to have in place. Um, and apply security controls to layers that make the most sense. Um, so some things may make sense to, you know, build an elaborate scheme out um, for doing things like um, mutual TLS between services. Um, or you may want to use something like, um, you know, Istio or Envoy um, that provides that infrastructure for you, right? Um, so it really does depend, I guess, on, you know, size of team, uh, capabilities, how fast you want to run, uh, and things like that. Uh, any questions? Yes. Could you, I'm sorry, could you repeat that last part one more time? Oh, um, I mean, so I like uh, using something like a vault or, you know, pulling that out of um, etcd. Uh, I mean, there's other things out there. I mean, you know, there's commercial products that do those types of things. Um, but I mentally, I like, you know, if, especially if I'm using, like, you know, a cloud platform, then I'd, I'd want to use whatever, you know, key management solution um, is, is, is there. I mean, I, I always, me personally, I favor, you know, first class implementations, um, you know, implemented into things like their IAM infrastructure and stuff like that. So, I mean, if I had my pick, then I'd want to use approaches like that. So, does that answer that? Okay. Yes. Yes. 
Um, so what he said in terms of how we'd actually run or run something like etcd, would we run or run, uh, run an etcd cluster um, where we have some replication um, and uh, the answer is, I mean, I see people do it both ways. They'll run them on the masters and sometimes you do see them split out to their own etcd. Um, in terms of, I guess, what I would prefer at that point, um, it's not bad to have them outside of the master. Uh, but then you still have, I mean, the same things you need to do at that point, right? Limit, um, essentially, who can talk to those, implement those same controls. I mean, if you can do, um, you know, out of master etcd replication, then, then sure, then it's not a bad thing at all from um, a security perspective, resiliency perspective, um, and, and having a little bit of separation between etcd and the masters, right? So um, absolutely, I, I don't disagree with that. Um, but the reality is, you know, then you have to have another couple boxes um, dedicated to run etcd at that point, right? So I mean, you could run into those things, D depending on the team and how many, how much, you know, just computing they have available. I think is going to dictate that. But Mm -hmm. um, so he basically said, you know, would you look to use something like OpenShift as opposed to like stock Kubernetes? Um, so, you know, OpenShift obviously is like an enterprise model to it, uh, but having said that, they do a lot of good things from a security perspective. Um, things like etcd are well hardened out of the gate, right? So there's, there's a fair amount of, you know, things like good security uh, control plane hardening there. Um, but I mean, at the same time, you do run into a lot of the same issues and a lot of, um, you know, things you can still kind of, you know, shoot yourself in the foot with with regards to over privileging containers, not using things like security context constraints properly. Um, and then you get into obviously, you know, all kinds of CI, CD pipeline issues and uh, pulling things from different container registries. But the nice thing about OpenShift is, you know, there's, you know, nice integration with their container registry, um, OAuth and things like that. Um, so yeah, I mean, if you're able to use a solution like that, then it's great. Um, but again, I mean, you know, Kubernetes itself can be secured to a similar level, but OpenShift does a lot for you, absolutely. Yes? So, you run to a lot of uh, libraries, OpenShift, um, how many libraries are you mm -hmm. Um, so your question was uh, people, I guess, accidentally copying files from the host into or, or giving access to? Mm -hmm. Right. Right. Um, so I guess your question at that point is, is how do you avoid stuff like that? Um, not specifically, no. So his question was, I guess, just what are people doing, I guess, or is there any, um, I mean, you know, I, I, I see people use a, a handful of different tools to do kind of validation of what's happening in the containers and stuff like that. Um, so the short answer is I don't know a specific tool dedicated to doing that, right? Um, but you could build something that's, you know, fairly easy to grep and, and run as a webhook every time you commit, right? So, um, yes. In terms of, could you repeat that one more time? I'm, I don't hear it. How many of the patterns that you talked about mm -hmm. are already covered by Crystal, Crystal, or Care? Ah. Gotcha. Um, so what she asked was, uh, what do the different, you know, commercial tools provide out there for security hardening um, that you, I guess, wouldn't get out of the gate of the things we talked about today? So. Um, the short answer is there's, there's a bunch of different tools out there and, you know, not going to get into like what each one of them does or does well or bad. Um, they all cover a different part of the surface, I guess. Um, so, you know, depending on which one, right, you maybe have less emphasis on like, um, you know, pipeline and, um, you know, deployment kind of stuff and more on like, you know, composition analysis, right? 
Um, so to be honest, I haven't seen one tool that, 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 that does everything you need from um, really getting control plane right to you know, understanding the code that's being deployed, um, asset inventory, right? I mean, everybody does kind of a little bit of each segmentation. Um, so it is one of those markets, cloud native right now, that there's a lot of room for innovation and there's a lot of like, unanswered things out there, right? So um, yeah, I hope that answers that. Any more? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, so what he asked was, um, we talked a little bit about using the service mesh pattern, uh, so using things like Istio and Envoy. Um, and he asked what is the security, I guess, upside of doing that. So uh, the short answer is that what we end up doing is deploying a sidecar container with our actual container. And what we end up doing is abstracting a couple different security operations out of it, right? So things like mutual TLS, you don't really need to worry about that inside of your container because it's handled by that. Um, sidecar that's essentially a proxy into that, right? So that's handling things like mutual TLS. That's handling things like access between microservices. Um, so for example, if this service shouldn't be talking to this service, um, then you can handle that from a key management and um, you know identity using like service accounts. You can do like Spiffy Inspire or the you know. Um, so you get that uh, that you can offload. Um, you can even offload a little bit of like monitoring and detection stuff, right? So um, things like those, uh, like Istio and Envoy, um, using the sidecar, um, allows you to do things like distributed tracing, right? So a lot of times we find that teams will spend a lot of time and money um, monitoring things like you know ingress and egress choke points, but they have absolutely no visibility of what happens inside of, um, for example, a set of microservices, right? So using a sidecar, they give you the ability to do a form of distributed tracing where you can basically have, mar it essentially puts a marker in there so you know like this came from like the service for example, right? And so you can, you know, do things like Grafana and other like tools to visualize like dashboard and actually see like for example, so you know, if you're looking and say, I want to know like for example, this, you know, this service is having issues all of a sudden, whoa, like, you know, basically like, you know, network utilization from this host spiked. Um, it gives you the ability to do that. You don't have to build those things into your containers. Um, and you can allow them to be pretty much as you know, small and dumb as possible and, and have that intelligence kind of built around them. That is a good pattern and that does seem to be what a lot of people want to do these days. Um, there's definitely some complexity in running things like Istio. It's certainly non-trivial in an implementation perspective. Um, and things like, for example, you, know, you might get, you know, uh, we introduce latency because we put a proxy in front of basically um, the service, right? Um, in reality, that latency is going to be fairly low in a lot of cases. Now, I'm not going to say that there's not, you know, streaming and, and real-time apps that that's not going to have a tangible impact on. Um, but, you know, for more, you know, services, I see that not being a huge issue that um, they've got the I.O. pretty fast at that point that it's, it's not a huge performance impact. So um, those would be the things I'd imagine someone would ask and that's how I'd answer them. So uh, any more questions? Cool. Well, thank you, everybody, and uh, have a happy Friday.